chapter 12 of The Missing Manatee with Mrs. Miller. I spent most of Friday searching the shoreline out in the Gulf. Saturday, I went back to searching the backcountry channels. It had been kind of fun the first time, but by the afternoon, I decided that looking for the channel maker in a heavy fog would be a lot easier than the task I'd set myself. I was about to give up and forget the whole thing. Then I spotted vultures circling in the sky. I felt my heartbeat quicken and told myself to settle down. Sure, something beneath them was dead, but it wasn't necessarily the manatee. I counted the vultures. There were 12. Whatever it was had to be pretty big to attract that large a crowd. I thought there were probably more on the ground already feeding. The problem was getting to them. I figured they were a quarter and a half mile away as the crow flies, but I had to find a water route and that was going to be tricky. It was, as the river heads to the ocean, it fans out into a lot of separate channels, but one main channel out in the Gulf, well marked so tourists can follow it. But there are a bunch of other smaller routes to the sea so that if you know the area and how much water your boat draws, there are lots of ways to go. Then there are about a gazillion smaller channels that branch off those channels leading into the back country. While this made our river interesting, it sure made my job harder. Keeping an eye on the vultures, I steered the boat down every little channel that appeared to lead in the right direction. But each route I took either came to an abrupt dead end or soon meandered away from where I wanted to go. Just as I began to be afraid that the tide would get too low for me to continue, I reached a large area of open, shallow water. At its far edge, I could see the hunched bodies of vultures feeding. I don't know why, but the sight of them hanging around like a bunch of ghouls made me angry. I shouted, get out, get lost. The birds in the air rose higher and soared off as my skiff approached. The ones on the ground seemed reluctant to leave their feast. But I kept screaming at them, and one by one, with a lot of awkward hopping and wing flapping, they took off. Leaving me alone with whatever it was they'd been eating, the smell wafered in my direction on the breeze. I cut the engine and drifted over to the lumpy mass lying in the tangle of mangrove roots. The vultures had eaten some of the evidence, but even in its stinky, disgusting state, it was obvious that this was the manatee. I let out a whoop. It was totally gross, but I'd actually found it. The birds had opened up its belly to feed and I tried not to look at the part, that part, but in my head and face, but at the head and the face, which were clearly visible. Tied around its neck was a circle of blue nylon rope. I stood still trying to push away the rush of thoughts that crowded my brain at the sight of the blue rope. I'd seen that same blue line, or rather a coil of line like it, just days before in the bottom of Dirty Dan's boat. After nearly slipping on it, I'd stowed it in the front storage compartment where the gun was. I leaned out of the skiff, picked up the end of the rope, and held it in my palm to feel its heft. It was the same weight line. I was sure. It was made of the same blue nylon. So what, I asked myself. Line like that is for sale at Larry's, where anybody can buy it off a huge spool. I looked at it more closely. It was old and frayed and discolored where the sun had beaten down on it, just like the rope in the bottom of Dirty Dan's boat. But that could have happened to a rope lying in anyone's boat or on anyone's dock. Just because there's a piece of it lying around a manatee's neck doesn't prove anything. And what exactly was I trying to prove anyways? Dirty Dan was the tarpon man. He was my hero. He was not a manatee killer. So what if he called manatees live speed bumps? He was only fooling around, grippling, as Earl had said, the whole idea that he killed a manatee? No, that was ridiculous. I was ridiculous. My imagination was way out of control. Then I remembered the ball at the scene of the crime. I would picked up trash for my still life project in art class. Among those pieces of trash was a ball. 
a fairly new yellow tennis ball. I hadn't thought anything about it at the time, but now in my mind's eyes, I saw Blink reaching into his pocket for a bright yellow tennis ball to throw for Blinky. Blink, who never went anywhere without a quarter for me to flip for him and a yellow tennis ball for Blinky to chase. Blink, who was Dirty Dan's son. Blink, or maybe Blinky, could have dropped the ball in the boat and it could have fallen out when Dan was working to hide his tracks. Or maybe Blink and Blinky had been with him in the boat that day. It didn't really matter. Take the rope or the ball or the gun one at a time and they could mean anything. Put them all together and no, I told myself, there's got to be another way to look at this. I thought back to the day I'd bound the manatee. I tried to recall Dan's reaction to the news. He'd been at the River Haven Grill when Mac Earl and I had first discussed it. As far as I could remember, Dan hadn't said anything. He hadn't acted surprised or outraged like any, everybody else because he already knew. Suddenly, I remember the feeling of being watched. When I was standing by the manatee's body that morning, had I been seen by Dirty Dan? He had listened to my story and then he'd asked me if I wanted to go tarpon fishing with him. At the time, I'd been too thrilled to ask myself why, but now I wondered, why had Dirty Dan, the tarpon man, asked me then, on that particular day, when I had been dying to go fishing with him for as long as I can remember, and why me? I figured it was because I was Mac's son and had even dared to suppose it was because Dan liked me and thought I was finally a good enough fisherman to catch a tarpon. But what if he was only trying to keep me from thinking about the dead manatee? What if he was trying to get me on his good side in case I did somehow discover the terrible thing he had done? Of course, it, that was it. Why would Dirty Dan spend a whole day pulling me around after Tarpon? What did he get out of it except the hope that I wouldn't discover what a slime ball he was? Or if I did, that I'd be too odd or grateful to do anything about it. He played me for the fool and I'd fallen for it. I sat in the skiff, my head in my hands, as alternating surges of anger and humiliation and doubt passed through me. What was I doing? I couldn't just condemn Dirty Dan, who was Mac's good friend, and who had helped me catch my first tarpon on the fly. I had to be sure. Then I thought of a way. I reached into my pocket for my pen knife. Trying not to gag, I leaned over close to the manatee's body and cut the rope from around its neck. Sawing through the line several times, I made eight small pieces. I pocketed both of the end pieces, one of which Dan or someone else, I reminded myself, had cut from a larger coil. Then at each turn that I came to as a work, as I worked my way back out toward the river, I tied a piece of rope onto a branch of the mangrove tree, like Hansel and Gretel, breadcrumbs, and scraps of blue rope would mark my path back to the manatee. I wasn't going to lose my proof again. There was just enough high water so that I made it to the river without getting stuck. Motoring up to Larry's, I paid that I prayed that I wouldn't run into Dirty Dan there. I didn't know what I'd do if I came to face to face with him. I had to be sure before I saw him. Then, when all my suspicions turned out to be wrong, maybe I'd tell him about it and we'd have a good laugh. I tied up my own skiff and looked over at Dirty Dan's slip. His boat was there. Looking around again, I saw no sign of Dirty Dan, and thank goodness for once, Blink wasn't around either. Feeling as if I were the criminal, I crept down the dock and into Dirty Dan's boat. I opened the front storage compartment. The molded plastic gun case and the gun were gone. But the coil of rope was there. From my pocket, I took the two pieces I cut from the manatee's neck. I held one up to the end of the large coil. The strands met or they had been cut with a knife. They matched perfectly. So what do you think it means when Skeet goes feeling as if I were the criminal? What do you think makes a criminal? <laughs>